Hello, everyone, and konnichiwa. Thank you for tuning in to our film and talk series, Healthy Hakko, the Fermented Culinary Arts of Japan. My name is Yuko Shimizu, and I'm the executive director of the Japan Foundation in Toronto. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to this special series in which we will present four documentary films and four talks with experts over the span of three weeks. The subject of the series is the various fermented foods and drinks that make up Japan's unique taste, such as shoyu, dashi, sake, miso, and more. We will explore the science behind fermented cuisine and the cultural impact these traditional foods have had on the Japanese identity. We will look back in time at how some of these foods came to be and how they have changed and developed, as well as what the future may hold for them. We are starting the first expert talk with an examination of fermented sushi and miso. Our two speakers are Dr. Eric Rath and Dr. Greg de Saint-Maurice. Dr. Rath is professor of history at the University of Kansas. He is a specialist on food history in pre-modern Japan and his books include Food and Fantasy in Early Modern Japan and Japan's Cuisines, Food, Place, and Identity. His newest book, Oishi, The History of Sushi, will be published in April this year. Presenting alongside Dr. Rath is Dr. Dirk Samuris, Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Business and Commerce at Keio University. Dr. de Saint-Maurice received his PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Pittsburgh in 2015. His key research interests include globalization, taste, culinary heritage, and local foodways, and Japan. His works have been published in the journals Gastronomica, Food, Culture, and Society, and other edited volumes. Thank you again for your interest in the series. Please enjoy this insightful and delicious presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Cindy and I am a program officer from the Japan Foundation Toronto. Joining me today are Dr. Eric Rath and Dr. Greg de St. Maurice, and we're here to talk about fermented food in Japan. Dr. Rath and Dr. de St. Maurice will each give a short presentation and then we will join together in a very brief discussion. Uh, so let's start us off with uh, Dr. Rath. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read the whole screen or not, uh, but my talk is about sushi and how sushi was once, and still is in some places, a fermented food. When we, the topic to, for today, of course, is about fermented foods. And you know, when you think about sushi, Fermentation is not the first thing that comes to mind, but yet this is a very important part of the history of sushi and in some types of sushi today. Sushi though, of course, needs no introduction from the high end thing, uh, sushi that we pay hundreds of dollars for uh, at, a, at a very fine sushi restaurant to the types of sushi that we could pick up at the supermarket. Sushi today is ubiquitous. Uh, that's one of the things that really amazes me as a scholar of Japanese food is how sushi has gone global. And we can find it everywhere in all sorts of different varieties. So it's a dish that really doesn't need introduction. When we think about the word sushi though, what does it mean? Well, in the 17th century, scholars were thinking about the same question about the meaning of the word sushi. And they theorized back in the 17th century that the word sushi was derived from the word sour or sweet. So sushi would be a sour food. If we look a little more closely at this character, sui, uh, we can see it has two meanings. First of all, uh, it could mean vinegar, although usually a different kanji that you'll see right there is used for the word vinegar. So it has a vinegary uh, meaning. And then it can also mean something that's acidic or sharp tasting or sour. 
So there's two different ways of pronouncing this particular character. And uh, one is vinegar, one is sour. And this is an idea that came up in the 17th century. Now, whether this was the reason why people chose the word sushi in Japan in the 8th century, we really don't know. Perhaps it was, perhaps it wasn't. But it's a nice idea, and that's what I want to kind of run with today, if you'll allow me. So when we think about sushi then, we really have two types. We have this sushi used, make, uh, made using vinegar. And that's the sushi that we're familiar with, whether it's the nigiri sushi, the hand-formed sushi, or else the maki sushi. The sushi rice has vinegar in it. Well, besides vinegar, usually a little bit of salt. Nowadays, people add a little bit of sugar. Uh, but that's how we get that kind of uh, distinctive sushi rice taste. So that's sushi used uh, made using vinegar that's, that we're very familiar with today. However, there's also sushi that's much older that relies on fermentation. This is where we fit in with today's theme. Uh, sushi made with lactic acid fermentation. Now lactic acid fermentation is the same kind of fermentation that uh, turns, that makes yogurt sour. So that sour taste when we have our uh, favorite yogurt, that's thanks to lactic acid fermentation. Unlike the sushi made using vinegar, which we prefer to eat right away. You know, who wants to eat old sushi? It sounds awful. Sushi made with lactic acid, acid fermentation takes a lot of time. It can take months. It can take years for the sushi to achieve its final uh, form. Some other things we have to know about the history of sushi, though, go back to China. So. Uh, when we first see the words for sushi, now both of those characters that we see on the screen are pronounced sushi in Japanese. The first one that appears is in the third century BCE, and it was pronounced ji, and it referred to fish and salt. So in other words, a sort of fermented fish dish, kind of like a Southeast Asian uh, fish sauce, if you will. Or in Jap Japan, they have a shirokara, this very salty preserved food, sometimes made with squid, that's a really nice side dish for drinking sake. So that's one type of uh, early beginning of sushi. Well, around third century uh, CE, this other term appears called ja, and that was fish and salt, and then some kind of grain. And so when we think about the terms of, of sushi, um, it seems like this ja is closer to it because it actually has uh, some sort of grain, like a rice involved. Well, by the end of the third century CE, both of these terms became mixed up and they were used interchangeably. So people would use G to refer to the fish with the salt and the grain. Let's look at an early Chinese recipe for this fermented sushi. And that comes, I don't know if you can read the whole uh, text there, but it comes from an early agricultural text, the Qimin Yaoshi, which is a, basically an early cookbook. Uh, it's translated as important arts for the people's welfare. It dates to the 6th century CE. And it's a really fascinating text because it, take, it, in, it includes the earliest and also the most extensive sushi recipe. Um, I, I could give you the whole recipe if you wanted, but we would be here for a long time. So I'm just going to give you the executive summary of it. Uh, this is a type of sushi made using carp. And that's pretty typical for ancient sushi, both in China and Japan, is it used river fish. Kind of hard to imagine, but yes, fish like carp. So uh, the steps were to clean and salt the carp, place in a container, such as a sushi bucket, like the one uh, from Gifu Prefecture on my slide, and then add cooked rice. But really, it's, it's very interesting. If you look very closely at the recipes for sushi in this book, and there's about six of them, you see it doesn't have to be rice. You can have cooked millet or some other type of grain when you make your sushi. Uh, kind of, seems counterintuitive. But then this uh, rice and salt I, uh, is also added and also sake, which is very interesting to me as a food historian because Japanese didn't add sake that we know for sushi recipes until the early modern period, until after the 17th century. And why would you add sake? Well, that facilitates the fermentation process, gives it a little bit of juice. Then, speaking of juice, the recipe calls for adding different flavorings. 
Some of them we can't identify, but one of them was clearly orange peel. So that must have been a very interesting sushi uh, flavor. Well, uh, all the, if, you, if you can imagine this in a sushi container packed with salted fish and some sort of grain that's also been salted and usually in different layers. And then there's some bamboo separating the layers and then some kind of top. Um, the directions ask you to do all this and then wait. You monitor the color of the liquid in the container. Uh, you wait and see if it, until it turns clear. You wait several months and then the sushi is ready. The interesting thing about this type of sushi recipe, it wasn't eaten raw, at least uh, from the other recipes in the Important Arts for the People's Welfare. Uh, this sushi was used in things like soups and stews. So it must, it, it's kind of a, a, a very interesting type of, of sushi when, when you think about it. Something that's added to a soup that's flavored with a little bit of uh, orange peel and other things. But I think the dominant flavor of this type of sushi would be sour thanks to the lactic acid fermentation. Because what happens is there's an anaerobic fermentation process that goes on and it uh, turns the uh, bones and, and, and the rest of the flesh into some tasty amino acids and totally changes the flavor profile of the fish at the same time it preserves it. The rice here or any other grain is not really um, critical for the final outcome of the taste. Rather, it's to facilitate fermentation. It provides uh, the starch, which transforms into sugar that allows fermentation to occur. So it's a, it's a, a, a substrate like a, a pickle substrate for uh, making the fermented sushi. Well, that's the history of sushi in a nutshell in China in the sixth century. What happens to Japan? Well, sometime by the eighth century, sushi appears in Japan. At least the characters for sushi appear. We, we don't really know what it was, but scholars surmise that sushi was a fermented dish in the eighth century, just like the Chinese one. And they can also see the great variety of, of sushi that was made. So we have references to carp sushi, abalone sushi, sweet fish or ayu sushi, and then as well as uh, sushi made from different animals like deer and boar. And this was a, not, a, not a typical food back in the eighth century, but where these references occur, they occur on uh, wooden document tags called mokkan that were shipping tags. Basically like if you go to the airport and you check your luggage and you get that long strip uh, that's attached to your suitcase. This is the eighth century equivalent. They were wooden tags. And these wooden tags reveal uh, what type of sushi was available and where it was going. A lot of places around Japan sent their sushi up to the court as a tribute food. So it's kind of an elite food back in this period. Well, the sushi recipe changes over time. What we know is that if it's sushi that it takes months to years to make in the ancient period, well, we can read from the document record that the recipe changed because we have new terms for sushi that appear in the medieval period around the 15th century. We see this term uh, fresh mature, matured sushi, <clears throat> which refers to a type of sushi that didn't go undergo this whole fermentation process. In other words, people got anxious and they wanted to eat their sushi sooner. So they did, and they called it a different name. And they probably at that point ate the rice as well. Uh, when you're doing the ancient form of fully fermented sushi, you don't need that rice once you, the sushi has fermented. You can toss it out and it's kind of, it's kind of very sour to eat. But in the medieval period, at least it's my um, hypothesis that people started eating that rice. Well, if the history of sushi is about impatience, uh, this happens uh, in the early modern period as well. People want to eat their sushi faster. So we have this type of sushi that appears called fast sushi. This was, wasn't quite fast sushi. It was sushi made in a couple of days instead of a week or a month. And how did they make it fast? Well, in the early modern period, they added things like sake, like koji, which is used to ferment uh, sake, which is used in sake uh, brewing, or they used finally vinegar. So this is when we see vinegar 
introduced into sushi making. And of course, nowadays, vinegar is the dominant form of, of sushi, uh, for sushi rice. Uh, modern sushi, the best sushi, I think, uh, is, is sushi that's made in front of you, right in front of, by a sushi master. And so we really want to have our sushi fresh. And it would be counterintuitive to imagine a sushi that would take days or weeks or months to years to make. But this ancient form of sushi uh, still exists in Japan. For example, if you go to uh, Shiga Prefecture, you can have Funa Zushi. Funa is a type of carp. It's a crucian carp. It's a carp about as big as your hand. And the local people in Shiga catch these carp in March or April. Then they salt them to preserve them. Then around August, they make Funa Zushi out of them. They cook rice, they add salt, uh, they pack the carp in with the salt and rice and wait. And if you look closely on the slide, and I'm glad you can see it, you see this orange material in this funazushi sample. Uh, this is the row from the female carp. And this is thought to be, you know, the most desirable type of fish. In other words, we have kind of a, uh, sexual discrimination. People prefer uh, female carp, female crucian carp for sushi than male carp. Although the male carp tastes just as good, but they don't have that lovely orange row inside. So if you have a chance to go to Japan, you can try Funazushi in Shiga Prefecture. And I really recommend doing that. It's, it's uh, quite a unique taste. And if you go there, you can see that some very, uh, innovative local chefs are doing new things with funazushi. So for example, I, I visited a restaurant called Biwako, da Biwako Daughters uh, in Shiga, and the proprietor makes a funazushi sandwich. And what she does is she takes this really crusty Italian bread, and she gets uh, this lovely Dutch Havarti cheese, and then takes a few slices of this uh, wonderful funazushi and puts it in with a sandwich. And you might think, what the heck is this? How would you do something like that? A sushi sandwich? It's counterintuitive, but actually, the taste of funazushi, it's quite like a prosciutto or a summer sausage, depending on how thick you slice it. So with this combination of a crusty Italian bread and a lovely sort of Dutch cheese, and you can toast it, uh, you, you get a remarkable sandwich and you feel like you're eating some amazing salami uh, from, from some place in Italy. It it's totally blows your mind. But what's even more mind blowing is the dessert because she takes a uh, metal pond. Usually these metal pond are, as you probably know, me melon bread looks like a melon. It's, it's a uh, confectionery. It's a, it's a dough bread with a cookie top. And usually it's golden brown. And it looks kind of like a musk melon. And that's perhaps how the, where the name comes from of melon bread. But in this case, she uses a uh, chocolate melon bread. Melon bread. And uh, this is, comes from a local bakery. And then cuts it in half and then makes this wonderful cream using a little bit of the rice from funazushi and mixes it all up. And it's remarkable. It has this lemony, citrusy taste, but there's no lemon in it. And that's all thanks to the fermented sushi rice. So I'm very excited about this as someone who has studied the history of sushi. I think this is like the, maybe the next big thing in sushi. And it's just fascinating to me to see uh, how ancient sushi recipes can be used in this very innovative way. So the story of sushi as a fermented food goes on and continues in new and exciting ways, I think. So I think I'll stop there and I'll be glad to take questions and have a dialogue with uh, Greg a little bit later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raff. Uh, that was a very visually appealing presentation, probably one of the most visually appealing presentations I've ever seen. Uh, I feel like we should add a warning to this recording. Do not watch while you're hungry. Um, so I'll save my questions for later, and I have quite a few. And I guess we'll turn the camera to Dr. De St. Maurice. All right. Thank you. 
And thank you, Eric, for that presentation. I love the descriptions as well. Okay, so uh, I will follow uh, Eric Rath's presentation on uh, fermented sushi by giving some background on miso and explaining how miso um, is not just a soup and how we've seen a lot of changes really to miso production and consumption. Um, so I'm assuming that most of you know that uh, miso is used to make soup and probably uh, that one of the main ingredients in miso is soybeans. Um, the other main ingredients are water and salt. Um, but there's another important ingredient uh, in making miso, and that's what makes it a fermented food. It is a koji. And here uh, on this slide, you can see rice koji. So this is rice that has um, the koji mold, Aspergillus orizae, on it. Um, what's interesting about this mold in particular in Japan and in terms of the national discourse on you know, what is a national cuisine is that in 2006, Aspergillus orizae was um, deemed the national mold of Japan by the uh, Japan Brewers Association. So some countries have national birds and you know, national flowers, things like that. Well, Japan also has a national mold. Um, and this is it. As for the process of making um, miso, it depends a little bit on what kind of miso you're making. And I'll talk a little bit about those uh, later. But in this um, sort of collage of photos that I put together, um, you can see how uh, soybean miso, so miso that uh, uses soybean koji, is made. Uh, you'll see that the soybeans are washed, soaked, then they're steamed. And uh, what is unique to making this kind of miso is that then the soybeans are really uh, packed into miso balls. And on them, they put uh, soybean koji, which grows for, you know, uh, a little more than three days, and then they put it in a tank um, together with salt and water, so a kind of salt water. And because this kind of um, miso that you have on this slide is a hacho miso, um, a famous uh, bean miso, soybean miso from Okazaki in Aichi Prefecture, they then will put um, a lot of stones on top, a lot of heavy stones. I'll show you a picture uh, shortly. And then they wait. And the uh, definition for uh, the two uh, different breweries in Okazaki City is that they have to wait uh, at least two summers in order to have, you know, hacho miso for them. Um, so during that time, of course, the miso is fermenting. And this is what it looks like inside those two uh, breweries. So you have the stones that are really just packed on top and the stones are all actually different shapes and sizes. Uh, when I went on a tour, the woman who was giving the tour said that it probably takes about 10 years for someone working in the brewery to understand exactly where each stone should go because uh, getting the right balance is actually pretty difficult. But uh, not all miso is made in that kind of um, factory. In fact, uh, here is a photo from a much, much smaller place in Kyoto, where um, again, they're using a wooden barrel to age the miso, but um, here it's a rice miso. So rice miso using a rice koji instead of the soybean koji, um, but also aging it. And we have, of course, um, more industrial pr production of miso. Uh, in fact, because in Japan, you can, if you look at statistics for 
uh, MISO sales, there's been a lot of consolidation of the MISO industry and also uh, unfortunately decreasing variety in terms of kinds of MISO. Uh, in one of the books I read about, you know, MISO, uh, say, was it like 50 years ago, it said that there were a thousand kinds of different miso in different regions. Uh, unfortunately, that's dwindling. And most of the miso that's sold today is uh, Shinshu miso, so from the area around Nagano. And um, there are very famous brands for miso. I'll show you uh, some examples from the supermarket. Um, but here you can see how miso is produced at a much larger scale and it will end up in a tank like this instead of um, a tank that is, instead of a wooden barrel for aging. It will be aged in um, you know, a bigger, much, much bigger um, container. Um, when I said that there were different kinds of miso, uh, here is a map that sort of charts out the differences. So the differences are very visible geographically. Um, they tend to be a little bit darker in the north and a little bit lighter in the south, but um, the darkest miso is um, in the area around the place that makes Hacho miso. So you'll see in Aichi, Gifu, and Mie prefectures, you have the soybean miso. And then um, in the area around and near Kyoto, you have a white miso that is particularly sweet. But in other parts of Japan, you also have other different varieties of miso. Um, and I guess notably too, in the south, the miso there is also a little bit sweeter and made with barley. So barley miso also uses a, a barley koji instead of a rice koji. And so in preparation for today's talk, I decided that I was going to go to the supermarkets uh, around me and see what they had. Um, you know, the average consumer uh, doesn't buy miso that often. Um, and I've only gone to these stores myself once or twice to buy miso. Um, but I wanted to see and compare. The one thing that surprised me, first of all, was that even though right now I'm speaking to you from the Tokyo, Yokohama area, I found a surprising array of misos from all over Japan. So just looking at this slide right here, um, I think the one in the top left is from the Toyama area. Um, then right next to it is a hacho miso and then uh, the top right is from the tohoku area it's a sendai miso uh, on the bottom left is a miso from kyoto so it's a white miso uh, the one right in the center at the bottom is from hokkaido and the one uh, in the bottom right is a kyushu miso made with barley uh, so that was the first thing that uh, surprised me, was really the variety that was available in a regular supermarket, or in this case, uh, several different supermarkets. Um, and I even asked uh, one of the workers, is, you know, the, really the variety of miso here uh, more than it usually is, because New Year's is coming around and people might be preparing uh, special dishes um, including right the special soup um, ozoni for their families and they said nope it's always like this um, this geographical diversity for miso isn't just about the ways that miso is made but also different areas tend to put different things in miso so in ehime for example what they do is they put uh, sea bream in miso um, which was something that I hadn't known about until this year. If you go somewhere like Okinawa, you'll find miso that's sold with meat in the miso. Um, and so it can be used for making things like onigiri or uh, used for snacking with cucumbers or uh, that kind of thing. Uh, of course, 
consumption trends change. And I'll talk about uh, those kinds of statistics in a bit. But first, um, I found it interesting that there were some miso varieties that were sold as being um, you know, more traditional. And so here you have uh, the terms on there, mukashi nagara, just like the olden days. And it says natural and no additives. Um, by which they usually mean that there's no alcohol added to stop the fermentation at the end of the process, which is something that is often done. Um, it means also that there's no MSG added um, and no dashi. So a lot of the misos that you can buy today in Japan have dashi added to the miso because when consumers make miso soup at home, they usually prepare dashi and then add miso to the broth. Um, dashi being right the soup stock that is made usually with um, kombu seaweed and uh, katsuo bushi, so uh, dry smoked bonito flakes. But here, um, or in a lot of other misos, that is already added. And here they're telling, telling you that nothing has been added. And uh, much more than in the past, today you can find in Japan a lot of misos that have a reduced sodium content. Um, so both of these, the one on the left and the one on the right, are both advertising the fact that they have a reduced sodium count. Um, miso often gets labeled as a um, high sodium food. Uh, and so people who are conscious of their sodium intake might um, be more hesitant to buy it. And this is one way that companies have tried to meet their needs. Uh, another way that um, companies have tried to adapt to a changing market is by making it more convenient to use miso. And here we have some uh, plastic bottles, some squeezable tubes um, that you can use to make miso soup at home. It's much easier than scooping out the miso, making sure that you, know, you don't have lumps of miso in your miso soup. Um, and these seem quite popular. Um, in terms of what people do with miso, I wanted to make sure that uh, people understand that it's not simply just the uh, average miso soup that can come along with a meal. This um, right here is one of my favorite winter dishes. It's um, a kasujiru, right? Um, so what you would use to make this is obviously um, some miso and preferably white miso. Uh, you would also use sake lees. And of course, Toronto has a sake brewery and you could get sake lees there. When I lived in Toronto, I did. Um, and then you would add some vegetables and you could add either pork or you could add salmon and make a nice, almost like a hot pot, but really it's, they call it a soup, but it's uh, really quite filling. Um, and that, so that's one thing that you could do. Um, another way that people eat um, miso is by grilling uh, vegetables or um, other kinds of ingredients or foodstuffs with it. So here, this is eggplant with a nice um, sweet miso glaze. Um, this is more of a summer dish. Um, but people do other things with miso. They can use miso uh, as a dressing. So um, they mix miso with, say, vinegar or other things, and then put it with vegetables, and also as an agent um, for marinades. So you can marinate tofu, you can marinate eggs, um, you can do that with fish. All of these things um, you can put in the refrigerator for a while with miso, and it will give it um, a little more taste. So having said that, um, consumption trends in Japan for miso are changing. Unfortunately, in doing a little bit of research for today to give you some uh, specific numbers, I found that uh, the way these statistics were compiled 
uh, hasn't always been the same, so it's difficult to compare. But um, in looking at statistics from uh, 2012 to 2018, we see um, some steady uh, decreases in consumption. And this is true of almost every age group, um, and particularly for uh, older people. So people over the age of 75 are in particular actually um, consuming less miso than they used to. Uh, there are also disparities uh, according to region, according to which city you're in, um, and I can talk more about that if there's interest. But uh, fortunately for Japan's miso sector, um, exports are increasing. Uh, they're increasing tremendously. And in fact, um, the top three countries for uh, miso exports are the US, uh, South Korea, and France. So Canada is not yet <laughs> up there at the top. But um, yeah, miso exports have been uh, good for Japanese miso companies. And so as we see, uh, there have been a lot of changes over time to um, Japan's miso industry. Um, but there remains a lot of diversity and people use miso in a lot of different ways uh, in their households. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I learned a lot about miso in a very short amount of time. Um, okay, I guess we can move on to our discussions panel. Um, I have a few questions here, but the, the one thing um, that I'm, I'm quite curious about is for both miso and I guess fermented sushi, is that something the average person with a little experience can do themselves at home if they have the right ingredients? Because I imagine, well, I know in, in Korea, at least in South Korea, you know, a lot of families are still making their own kimchi. So in Japan, is this the same case with miso and sushi? So with Miso, yes, people do make um, miso. Some, some people make miso at home, um, particularly actually uh, older women. So um, I did some research on uh, foodways in 1975. And to do this research, I talked to a lot of um, women who were a little bit older. And I surprisingly found out that a lot of them tend to make miso today, too. Um, there are also uh, a lot of people who find miso to be something fun to make at home. Uh, and so I, I actually was wondering if uh, just as we see with the pandemic uh, outside of Japan, a lot of people in say the US anyways, making sourdough bread, yes. right? <laughs> Being this big thing. So I asked my friends who make miso if they saw a similar trend here and they said no. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just too bad. That would have been a really fun uh, coincidence. But uh, speaking of miso, first, I, I just recall some ethnographic um, work that I read from the oh 1920s, 1930s in the Hida region of Gifu Prefecture, and the author was saying how important miso was ma was making was for people there. Uh, it was, there was a common saying in that region that it, for women, it was more important to be able to make miso than it was to uh, be able to sew. So that it's really sort of a critical foodstuff. And not only that, people took great pride in the fact that they could eat miso that was two years, three years, four years old, because that showed that they didn't have to leave, live hand to mouth they could have a store of miso over time. So miso has incredible cultural significance. Now, turning to fermented sushi, some people do it in various parts of Japan, but it's rather rare. And uh, I was in a, a conversation with a chef once about, um, he, he was making a type of this, uh, this, this sushi that's not fully fermented. Uh, namanare is what it's called. 
And I said, so do people in this region still make this not fully fermented sushi? And he says, yes, I went to a festival once where local people had brought the nominated sushi that they had made. And we could all taste it. It was kind of like a, a craft brewery festival. People brought, you know, different, different things and they could taste and trade and swap ideas. And he said, you know something? After tasting everybody's homemade food is the sushi, they were all awful. <laughs> But I think that maybe he's, he, as a professional, he took a, a different view of it. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's in the business of making this. So, of course, he's, he's, he has all this expertise to make the best type of uh, semi-fermented sushi. But it goes to show you that people are making it uh, in Japan. And maybe they are kind of just trying to do it because they're following tradition, but also because they're interested in the craft of it. So... Um, Perhaps we'll see a resurgence. Uh, that would be wonderful. But it has, it's a, it has a very niche market. Miso, everybody has miso, but fermented sushi, not quite. <laughs> would that have anything to do with the taste, perhaps? Because you mentioned that it kind of tastes sour, like our yogurt. Uh -huh. You know, when I first had the uh, funazushi that I mentioned in my talk, this uh, fermented uh, crucian carp sushi, it really reminded me of a taste of childhood, two tastes. First of all, uh, the taste of a very sour candy. I, I had this memory from childhood of my friend and I walking back from school and we would always, you know, see what kind of candy we had. And he had this sour ball and I said, oh, I want one of those. He says, no, you're not gonna like it. I was like, oh, give me that thing. It was this huge sour ball candy. And I put it in my mouth and like my whole face, you know, twisted and contorted when I tried it. And the same thing happened when I had funazushi for the first time. <laughs> oh, but it doesn't last a lot long. And there's another kind of flavor that reminded me of childhood. It reminded me of um, going up, I live in the Chicago area, and going up to Wisconsin and having summer sausage because it has this meaty profile. So funazushi has this sourness. It has this meaty, sausagey taste, and the smell is like a washed French cheese. So very sort of pungent, uh, fermented smell. So combine all that, and it's it's a very interesting type of food. And it's it's not. I mean, when I went to Japan to do research on fermented sushi, I ate a lot of it. I, I think that was like my basic, uh, what I subsisted on for three days, and I had enough of that. You know, it was just like too much. But if you have a little bit with some sake and beer, mm. perfect. You know, that's the greatest sort of accompaniment for those, for alcohol or um, tea. For the, uh, on, on your slides, uh, you mentioned that in Shiga Prefecture, they're doing the, uh, the fermented sushi on, on Italian bread. And you said it tastes a little bit like prosciutto. Now, I don't associate prosciutto with sourness. So that particular... Sushi, would it be like saltier? Somehow the sourness, the, 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 the bread, the Italian bread and the cheese compensate for the sourness. And what you get is the meatiness of the funazushi. And really it's more of a prosciutto taste because of the, the slicing. When, when the fish ferments, it's amazing. It, the size of it shrinks and it gets very, very thin. So the, the flesh of the fish is, is, is just like a slice, like, like a slice of, uh, of prosciutto. That's in, in terms of its thickness. I see. But of course, if you cut a thicker slice, then it, it can be like a summer sausage. So that's, that's what immediately struck me is I got that meaty taste and then also the, the bread helped to balance out the sourness. And it, it, was, it was really delicious. And uh, for you, Dr. Desingeris, um how many types of sushi, uh, miso have you tried while doing research on miso variations? How many types of miso? I don't even know. Um, I mean, miso isn't my research focus at all, but I, I have done a lot of research on local cuisines. And whenever I go somewhere new, I do uh, make sure to try the miso. Um, and I, I sometimes pick some up. And so my fridge happens to have a lot of different kinds of miso uh, and I don't use it <laughs> fast enough. But uh, 
you know, a few weekends ago, I was in uh, Niigata city and there they have several different kinds of miso. So I picked up some, some of, uh, one of the things that's really special about the miso in one of those areas of Niigata is that they actually have the little um, pieces of rice in there they don't um, smush it up or, or make it disintegrate. And so, uh, you know, just looking at the texture is really interesting. So, so how, many uh, how many containers how many? of miso do you have in your fridge right now? Probably like five or six. <laughs> That's actually. a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think I also have some jars with um, miso with yuzu in it and miso with um, like uh, spring vegetables, mountain vegetables in it. Uh, so that's more of a bitter miso. Uh, <laughs> wow. But there are a lot of things that you can do with miso. So, In, in Canada, at least, um, you know, when I go to a supermarket, it's pretty rare to find any types of miso outside mm -hmm. of, you know, the white miso or the red miso, or if you're really lucky, you know, a mix of the white and red. Um, but as we've seen from your presentation, there are obviously a lot of variations. So for the average Canadian consumer who, you know, might not be able to make their own miso, what, uh, what can they do with the miso they buy from the local supermarkets aside from making soup? Sure, so I'm glad that you asked uh, because I don't have photos that I could put in my presentation um, for, for this, but actually uh, people put miso in all sorts of things that you might not normally think so uh, when I went to uh, Aichi Prefecture to do a little bit of research on, on miso, I found them putting their local miso in things like uh, spaghetti sauce and curry. Wow. <laughs> um, which you might not expect, but they do it because, right, uh, it is a source of sodium, but also it has a lot of, right, umami from the glutamic acid mm. from the um, fermented soybeans. Um, I myself put it in chili um, and I also put it in meatballs when I make like pork meatballs um, as a flavoring agent. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Um, you can mix it with something like honey or with um, maple syrup to glaze, to use as a glaze on salmon or chicken or something like that. Uh, there are really so many things you can, <laughs> you can do with miso. Um, but I would think if you can, you can experiment by adding things like, right, maple syrup or honey or vinegar, and then uh, just, you know, making your own kind of miso sauce. That's, that's very Canadian of you to mix maple syrup. And miso. <laughs> um, I'm glad you that's mentioned, <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the sodium aspect and you touched upon mm. it a bit in your presentation as well. Now, when people think of uh, Japan and Japanese people, um, we associate the, Jap the average Japanese citizen with you know, living a long life, being very healthy, and it turns out they eat a lot of fermented food that have high sodium content, like miso and soy sauce. So in that respect, how do Japanese people stay healthy? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I think, Sodium, of course, is as said, that's a real issue and something that everybody has to be mindful of globally. Um, but I also have to you have to be cautious about focusing on just one factor, you know, whether it's good or bad. Uh, people are saying, for example, that certain foods, certain beverages, you know, are sort of wonder foods. Um, maybe they do have some sort of benefit, uh, but really you have to look at it. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a nutritionist, but you really have to look at a person's whole um, food intake and lifestyle. And I think, you know, generally from what I see in Japan, if you go to a city, people are walking, mm. for instance, and you have to walk and people walk. They're brilliant at their walking in, in, in the subways, how people navigate and go to commute and everything. Um, so if, if you're exercising and you're conscious of, 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 of a, trying to eat a balanced meal, whether that means Japanese food or Western food, then I think you're doing a lot for your health. Mm. Uh, maybe if your sodium is a little bit high, 
uh, it's something to be mindful of, but uh, it, it's not going to be the, you know, the sole factor in determining longevity or healthiness. But I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just sort of thinking about the Jap Japanese dietary trends. And I know that there have been studies that try to isolate, you know, what is it about the Japanese diet that's so healthy? And it's people can't do it. You know, it's, it's a combination of factors. Mm. You know, that, at least that's my understanding of the research that's been done so far. Yeah, and actually about... Uh, to bring it back for a second to miso soup specifically, uh, I know that in Japan, you see nutritionists in schools who are definitely concerned about, right? So a cup of miso soup or a bowl of miso soup has, you know, a gram of sodium. Uh, if we use a gram for that, we can't use it for other things in the school lunch. Mm -hmm, so yeah. let's have miso soup less frequently. Um, but actually, when you think about all of the other things that can go into miso soup. So, right, you can put a lot of different vegetables, including ones that are high in potassium. Um, and when you have that kind of balance and, you know, overall, when you look at a diet overall, it can be more, you know, healthy and nutritious. And sort of, right, like Eric said about focusing on just one thing, mm -hmm. um, that, does, that does tend to show more of a distorted picture. And also, if I may, uh, it, it, I know Miso really excited people in the macrobiotic movement because we have these books that were published. When was it? In the 1970s, the book of Miso, the book of tofu, mm. telling people, uh, you know, telling English language readers how to make their own Miso, the benefits of Miso, mm. the benefits of fermented food. So uh, maybe it's, it's like fish consumption. Uh, there might be issues with mercury. There might be issues with other sort of things with fish, but by and large, it's better to eat those fish um, than not eat them because of the uh, benefits from doing so. And I think probably the same is true of miso as well. It's better to have that fermented food in moderation uh, than, than, not, than to cut it out of your diet completely. So I'm kind of sad to hear that uh, school nutritionists are taking miso soup out of the lunch. Great. What do you think? Especially because when, when you think about people's uh, you know, sodium intake levels, if they're really high, it's probably not the miso soup. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, it's the snack foods and things like that. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And having been in a Japanese school and eaten Japanese school lunch, it's, it's like you said, it was very well balanced every day. They put a lot of thought into um, wow. what to feed the children and then well, the children run around for at least half an hour every day. <laughs> and uh, yes, they stay quite fit. Well, those are all of my questions. Um, I was wondering if you had questions for each other. It's okay if you don't. Oh, I actually did have questions. I there you go. All these, um, on all these post-its around here. Um, so I was really intrigued by the... Uh, addition possibly of millet, right, instead of rice. <clears throat> and I was wondering if you could, um, you know, just talk a little bit about how, you know, they might have used different grains at the beginning and how right. long they might have lasted. Yeah, when you think about it, um, the purpose of a grain in the fermented sushi is basically for the fermentation process the starches in the grain will break down into sugars and those become available for fermentation. So you really don't have to eat it. And indeed, some people who eat, who eat funazushi today don't eat it because that rice is the most sour part. And it also has lost its uh, texture completely. It's like a, if you ever cook millet and then cook it and cook it and cook it and it just, it's kind of this mush, that, that's kind of the, the flavor uh, and mouthfeel of uh, funazushi. Not the flavor so much because the flavor is very sour, but the mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of any grain is for the fermentation process. And I think it, if, if the memory serves, mm -hmm. there's about as much um, possible sugar that you can get out of millet as you can from, from, from rice. Uh, yet, you know, today we think of sushi as a rice food. And I think a lot of scholars have looked at it that way, but these sushi made with a variety of different grains, they were made up through uh, the 1940s in Japan. 
Uh, so yeah, so there were lots of, of, of regional varieties of, of sushi that did not use rice. When you think about it, um, rice is, is hard to grow in a lot of regions of Japan, either due to climate, uh, you can't have, I believe with rice paddy, you can't have any kind of incline over what, eight degrees or something like that. Uh, and we think about how mountainous Japan is, well, you can grow a lot of other crops up on those slopes with uh, slash and burn agriculture or what have you. And so a lot of people might grow some rice and uh, use that to pay their rent or their taxes historically, and then live on these other types of grains. So when it came time to make sushi uh, or just to eat, they would rely on those grains uh, for, for those purposes. Unfortunately, I've never had an opportunity to try uh, a millet sushi or a sushi made with other types of, uh, of grain. I hope to be able to do that someday. I'm, I'm sure someplace in Japan it's being made right now. That um, sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, m my other question actually relates directly to this uh, sourness thing. So it mm. sounds right, like, like your research has, has shown that, so if we look way back, um, sushi was fish plus grain plus sour. Yes. So it's so curious that the sourness has stayed on there. Mm. Uh, you know, sour isn't one of people's preferred tastes. It's not valued as much in terms of how people talk about food. Yeah. You, know, you don't hear people saying, this is so sour. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, right. But isn't vinegar something really marvelous? I mean, if you cook, somehow you add a little bit of like apple cider vinegar or something like that to a dish, whether you're making Western dish or Chinese food and the flavor really pops when you do that. So there's something about it. Um, so yes, the sourness has continued, but the basis for that sourness has changed for most of sushi. Now it's a sort of a um, sourness based on vinegar as opposed from lactic acid fermentation. But that seems to be a consistency. Yeah, when we think about sushi, like you said, Greg, we don't really think about sour. Uh, and if you were to say, hey, this sushi is really sour, I mean, people would, <laughs> <laughs> People would, would be running away from you, wouldn't they? Hmm. I, I have a question for Greg, if I, I can. I, I'm kind of uh, curious about this. You mentioned all the different regional varieties of miso and also the different kind of flavor profiles they had. What about the soybeans? That is a great question. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I've noticed that, right, Recently, especially for the larger makers, they import soybeans. Um, and actually, it's perfect for <laughs> today, but uh, a lot of the more popular soybeans come from Canada. Oh. Um, yeah. Australia, Canada. Yeah, and uh, one reason too is that they, is that some consumers tend to be wary of imported soybeans that are uh, genetically modified. And so when I go to actually my local um, tofu shop uh, and I buy tofu, um, there's the one that's made with local soybeans, I think from uh, the Tohoku area. So not super local, um, but the other kind is made from imported soybeans from Canada. And it says on the label, uh, not genetically modified. Mm. Um, but a lot of miso is made with um, imported soybeans. So from Canada or you know, the US, or I think at some point I read like Brazil maybe, but um, Russia too. But uh, there is also um, some domestic production of soybeans, but it's not you know, like it used to be. And a lot of it doesn't go into making you know, processed foods like miso. Um, because if they grow more expensive soybeans, it's a little bit better to sell them, um, you know, as this pristine, right, uh, mm -hmm. product and say it's from, you know, this part of Hyogo prefecture um, and, you know, to brand it that way instead of selling it for, um, to be made in miso. Although there are some uh, 
miso makers who do look for specific um, say varieties of soybeans, but that is actually pretty rare. I'm just thinking about your talk, and this is not really a question, it's an observation, but I mean, miso was the dominant flavoring in Japan up until the early modern period. Uh, and then it's still for your rural areas up until the 20th century, people didn't use soy sauce so much, they used miso. Really? Yeah, I mean, soy sauce is harder to make mm -hmm. and uh, you can make miso at home. So rural areas, especially the taste of rural areas, you, you read about in the 1930s, uh, early 1940s, that, that flavor profile, uh, a rural flavor profile involved miso instead of soy sauce because that's what was available. And people would go to, from the cities and they'd complain, where's my soy sauce? Well, we, we use miso here. And I, I, you know, soy sauce is wonderful, but so is miso. I think it really adds that umami, as you said, yeah. Craig. It's um, strange that you mentioned how prominent miso was not too long ago, but then in Dr. De Saint Maurice's presentation, we see, we're seeing this decrease in consumption of miso. Um, do you happen to know like, what attributes to that decrease at all, or I guess? Um, mm. <laughs> I, I, my suspicion is right, that people's diets have diversified a lot and mm -hmm. people um, are a little wary of uh, having um, a higher you know, sodium intake and miso has been, has been branded negatively like soy sauce um, in that regard. Um, but also, right, like, you know, miso was a preserved food, right? It mm -hmm. was beneficial in that kind of way. And today um, there's not as much of a demand for preserving foods. So, uh, you know, if people don't develop a lot of different recipes and different new ways of, of using miso, then it's going to disappear. And that's why you do see some innovation and you see it in similar ways um, as you see with uh, the funazushi. <laughs> um, because, right, uh, ultimately, if uh, producers and consumers don't ad adapt, it's just going to, um, you know, go away. Yeah. Well, that's, um, if, I, if I may, I just think, yes, um, with, with the advent of refrigeration in homes in the 19, late 1960s, then we see a decline of traditional pickle making and traditional fermented sushi making and what have you, because it's just the, not necessary to do that anymore when you have a refrigerator in your household. It's good to see that um, the export of miso around the world has increased so much. And, uh, and thank you for giving our audience some ideas on how to use their miso at home. Mm. I think I'll try it on pasta. That seems, <sighs> it seems it, like you said, it's, it, it'll lend an umami flavor to it. That'll be, I think, a little different and, and interesting. I'll try that. Good, yeah, I, I appreciate um, especially the taste of, uh, you know, darker miso, like the mm -hmm. bean miso with, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of say, um, you know, ground beef or something and potato and uh, tomatoes and, you know, just using that in, in there to complement it and bring out the umami. And, and as, sorry, and as oh, for uh, fermented sushi, I guess, um, do you happen to know if there's a, um, I guess, an audience for that outside of Japan, Dr. Ruff? I really hope so. I really, really hope so. I, I that's kind of like a dream for me <laughs> uh, that somebody in the mid part of the, of the United States where I live will recognize the fact that rather than getting some uh, imported endangered fish like bluefin tuna and using that for sushi, uh, rather to do, instead of doing that, look to the local sushi, that's, uh, local, local fish that are available and then uh, process those. Because oftentimes, it, of course in America, car carp has uh, going to have to jump some hurdles for people to want to eat it. Mm -hmm. uh, we think of, you know, when, when you think of carp consumption, we think of uh, intoxicated fraternity pledges from decades ago, swallowing goldfish and things like that. We don't really think about uh, carp as a food so much in, in the West, at least. Uh, although I think that's changing, certainly as other types of food traditions come in. But I, I really do hope that uh, some people, some 
perhaps some people who are watching us today will be inspired and will try to create some uh, fermented sushi. And then they can see, wow, what kind of flavor profiles mm -hmm. that they can create um, from some very basic ingredients and mother nature. Well, on that note, I think uh, we've been talking for more than an hour. And uh, what time is it over there in Tokyo? <laughs> it's almost midnight. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today from Tokyo and Dr. Rath from, are you in Kansas right now? I'm in the Chicago area Chicago? right now. Chicago, okay. Okay, so not too far behind us. Um, and not too early either. Not too early <laughs> either. <laughs> and not too late. Um, thank you both for giving your wonderful talks and for answering my probably very bad questions. I personally learned a lot. I hope our audience, when they watch this recording, will learn a lot as well. Um, I know, Dr. Rath, you have a book coming out. Um, do, can you tell us the title and when it's going to be published? Sure, thanks. Uh, it's coming out from Reaction Books which is also distributed by the University of Chicago Press. And it's called Oishi, the history of sushi. <laughs> and that's gonna be come out, that's gonna come out uh, sometime in 2021, at least by April okay. of 2021. And it's available on pre-order from your major booksellers. And in it, will you discuss more about what you talked today? Oh, sure, it's a, it's a history of sushi going back from ancient China and then several chapters on Japan, ancient Japan, medieval Japan, early modern Japan, modern Japan, and then so sushi's global um, globalization in the 20th century. So how sushi comes to America and is adapted and into Europe. Well, there you go. So if you haven't had enough of uh, mm -hmm. talks about sushi, go check out Dr. Rat's book coming out in April 2021. Yep. Well, um, thank you again. And uh, I think I will stop this recording now. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to the first part of our Healthy Hakko series. Be sure to check out parts two and three in which we will bring you more fascinating films and talks from experts about the fermented culinary arts of Japan. See you next time. <laughs>